Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this ISO 14001 2015 update webinar brought to you by NQA. My name is Richard Walsh, and I'm a regional assessor with NQA, predominantly assessing environment and energy management systems. A brief outline of what we're going to do next hour or so, uh, I hope to speak for about 50-55 minutes, something like that, and, uh, and then allow a short period of time at the end for questions. If you've not attended a webinar before, you should see on the right hand side of the screen a, uh, a box that should allow you to type in a question. If you type anything in there, I'll be able to see that. In terms of answering the question, if I feel it's something that's relevant to where we are in the presentation, I may just briefly pause and answer it there and then, otherwise we'll wait till the end. Um, just in terms of um, you having copies of, of the presentation, we are recording this presentation and it will be available on, on NQA's YouTube channel. You will also get, uh, I believe, a PDF copy sent to you or a link to, to get the PDF copy of the slide. So there's no need to madly write everything down that you see on screen. You can both view it and listen again uh, at your leisure. You can always also contact me at a later date. I'll, I'll give you my email address now, but I'll give it out again at the end. Uh, Richard.Walsh, W-A-L-S-H, Richard.Walsh at NQA.com. And if you suddenly feel that uh, you've thought of a question later on this afternoon or indeed at any other time, don't hesitate to contact me. So these are the things we're going to be looking through uh, in the next hour, uh, looking at some overarching concepts um, about the new standard, some rules for interpretation to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what, uh, what the standard's asking for, and then we'll have a look at a close-by-close -close basis to see what each clause says, look at the key concepts, look at what uh, the, the, the clause actually requires, maybe some audit criteria, and also a little bit of discussion around uh, audit evidence and the sort of things that we, as an assessment body, are likely to be looking for. So hopefully by the end of this next hour or so, you should be able to describe the new requirements of the standard, understand what each clause actually means, distinguish different types of requirements based on, on interpretation, so that's interpretation of individual phrases that are used within the standard, identify some examples of the required evidence, the types of things that we're going to want to see when we carry out um, a certification visit, and also then identify the types of documentation and communication requirements that are within each individual clause of the standard. Overarching concepts, there are some new and indeed modified concepts within ISO 14001 2015. For those of you who may have looked at 9001 or maybe sat through a 9001 webinar, you'll see that the standard is slightly different. Uh, ISO 14001 has no normative references and actually the standard itself contains all the definitions, interpretations, interpretations and information that you need within the one document. So for instance, if you were to compare the two standards, you'll notice that Annex A in ISO 14001 is 14 pages long compared to about three or four pages in 9001. And indeed Annex A, which is the second half of the standard, begins by stating that its sole intention is to prevent misinterpretation of the requirements. So some of the things I'm going to be talking about, some of the interpretations, some of the guidance I'm going to be giving you, you will find in Annex A. Now Annex A we don't audit against, but as I've said, it's there to, to help us clarify perhaps some of the terms and the concepts that are there within, within the standard itself. Management of change is reflected and addressed throughout the whole standard, and indeed both of the new standards, 9001, 14001, and, and I guess indeed 45001 when that appears either later this year or very early in 2017, will also have the same management of change addressed throughout the whole standard. There is a section called EMS suitability, 
and that's all about the context of the organization and we'll see in a short while that this is a much broader concept within an environmental management system than it may be in an equality system. Authority and autonomy, uh, as an organization you retain a certain amount of authority and autonomy to determine how to fulfill the requirements of the standard, how you integrate the requirements of the standard into other business processes, how you incorporate issues within the business into the context of the environmental management system and I guess most importantly with this new standard it allows you full authority and autonomy to maintain a practical and sensible level of documentation. Hooray, I hear you all shouting. At long last, we can decide what level of documentation we actually need. And then finally, we must consider issues that could be controlled or influenced. And again, the standard within, uh, within several of the clauses allows for a difference between whether we have full control over something or a limited amount of influence. And that's not the same, and, and that needs to be understood within the context of your organization. And then very, very finally, interpretation and definitions, the standard itself defines over 30 different terms and concepts. Just to have a look at two or three of them, just to give you an idea of the types of things that are in there, although I would suggest that you read section A3 within, within the standard, because this clarifies some of the terms used and we need to understand these clarifications so that we avoid misinterpretation and ensure that we all have a common understanding that both you as businesses and us as a certification body understand um, the, the, the rules for interpretation. So for instance, appropriate and applicable are not interchangeable. Um, appropriate in the context of, context of the standard means suitable for, but does imply some degree of freedom. Applicable means if it's relevant or possible to apply, or if it can be done, then it must be done. Similarly with consider versus take into account, consider means it's necessary to think about the topic, but it can be excluded if you so wish. Take into account, again, means it's necessary to think and consider it, but actually you then have to take the next step, which is to actually do something with it. You cannot exclude it. And then finally, one that's uh, a bit of a bone of contention for me sometimes, anybody who, who, who may have had the uh, fortune or maybe misfortune to have me as an assessor will see that uh, one of the things I, I pay a little bit of attention to as we look through the, uh, through the audit is the use of the word continual or continuous. The standard requires the term continual, not continuous. Uh, I have a little analogy that I tend to use to try and define or describe the difference between the two. Continual, which the standard requires us to use, the analogy I tend to use is a set of stairs. So the, the direction of travel is upwards, but it's not a linear motion, so we go up a step at a time. And there may be periods where we rest on a particular step before we then move on to, to step on the next step. Continuous is a ramp, never-ending improvement, never-ceasing improvement. We're better this minute than we were last minute, better today than we were yesterday, better this week than we were last week. That's not always how things are, so we need to see the word continual, and that's the word that the standard uses through about uh, all the different clauses. A couple of other little things that we look at. Persons doing work under its control, that's a definition that comes within the standard. It remains more or less the same as the old version, the 2004 version, but must now reflect the difference, as I stated earlier, between control and influence. So it covers contractors, subcontractors, your own staff, but it does allow now for you to identify the fact that maybe with a supplier you have a limited of influence, maybe you're a fairly small company with a very large supplier and you are a small part of their sales and therefore it doesn't give you that much control but you may still have a small amount of influence. Environmental performance refers to the environmental re results that are achieved whenever the environmental aspects of your activities, processes, products, services and systems are managed and controlled and indeed the intended outcome of the 
standard, which is shown at number five on the screen, there the intended outcome is improved environmental performance. Documented information has replaced a number of terms that were in the old standard and has replaced documentation, documents and records. They're all now called documented information. Compliance obligation, a compliance obligation is a requirement, that's all it is. And there are two times of com two types of compliance obligations, mandatory obligations, which include laws and regulations, and voluntary obligations, which include maybe contractual commitments, community standards, industry standards, ethical codes of conduct, good governance, etc., etc. However, an important point is that a voluntary obligation, once you've actually agreed to it or signed up to it, it then becomes mandatory. Now, for those of you who would still prefer to use the old term, legal and other requirements, then that is still an acceptable terminology within the standards. If you wish to still refer to a legal register and a legal register containing other requirements, then you are still free to do so according to, to the standard. We've said what the intended outcome is. There's actually three things that it, uh, the standard says is the intended outcome. One is the enhancement or improvement of your environmental performance. Secondly, the fulfilment of compliance obligations, mandatory and voluntary. And then finally, the achievement of your set environmental objectives. And then finally, at the end, another uh, definition thrown in for good measure, ensure, which is a phrase that's used quite a lot, responsibility can be delegated. So if you're a chief executive, you can delegate something. If you ensure it happens, you can delegate um, the responsibility for it happening, but you retain the accountability. And obviously the word any implies a full degree of selection or choice. Not going to dive through these in too much detail. Have a look at these in your own time. This just shows a little bit of where the standards come from. As you can see, environmental management systems have been around for nigh on 25 years now, 24 years to be precise. And I myself have been involved in environmental management systems since 1994, uh, when the first version of BS 7750 was formally launched at the end of the, the pilot phase. So you can see they've been around for well over 20 years, and the new standard, the 2015 standard, is going to take us probably another 8 to 10 years before that's moved or tweaked. So it's more important now with the new standard that uh, it helps us um, enhance our organization's environmental performance. It allows us to improve or reduce, should I say, our environmental risks. It allows us to make sure that we implement the requirements of our policy, achieve our set environmental objectives, meet environmental compliance objectives, and to take advantage, and this is something fairly new, to take advantage of environmental opportunities that may present themselves to us. And as environmental professionals, our job is fairly simple, and that's to make sure that all, all of that happens. This just recaps where the standard, the journey the standard came through. Again, I'm not going to go to, into any detail on this, but as you can see, it took a couple of years for the process to, um, to run, and on the 15th of September 2015, then the standard formally was, was published. <coughs> One or two people have been asking us about our transition process. I'm not going to go into great detail just at the moment about the transition process. However, suffice to say that any certificates that are to the 2004 or uh, 2004 standard will automatically expire on the 15th of September 2018, three years from the publication. Uh, we're recommending, um, and we will go into this in much more detail if you speak to your assessor, but we are recommending that the best time to actually transition will be when your next recertification visit is due. Um, if you go onto our website, there's quite a bit of information now about the transition process, or indeed if you speak to your assessor. Uh, we've all been trained uh, about the uh, transition process and we have some information and some guides that we can make available. Again, I've covered a little bit of this, but why did we need to change? What was wrong with the old standard? Well, 
it's 10 years since the uh, over 10 years now since the old standard was was written we need to maintain relevance I think our understanding of environmental issues within business has come on quite a bit in the last 10 years and as I've already said the new standard is going to be around for 8 to 10 years so we have to provide this consistent foundation for going forward over the next 10 years it's there to reflect the increasingly complex environments in which we all operate and I think one of the comments about the older standards has been that they were written more uh, for manufacturing organizations and they made much more sense if you were a manufacturing company producing widgets uh, at the end of the end of a production line so they are there to try and acknowledge the fact that this is relevant to all types of business and also to widen the corporate governance side there's a new clause called leadership which we'll look at and then finally one of the main reasons to push for easier integration of the different management systems and all of the new standards, the new 9001, obviously this standard 14001 and indeed 45001 when it's published will all follow Annex SL. I'm not going to go into too much detail about Annex SL, suffice to say that it was a template for all new standards. So at long last, 9001 and 14001 have the same clause numbers and a lot of the wording is common to both standards. Both of the standards follow the, uh, the Deming cycle, if you are a quality professional, plan, do, check, act, and that shows the new standard with set out in plan, do, check, act format with the clauses uh, on there, with uh, on the left hand side the inputs and on the right hand side the intended outcome, which if you remember predominantly was the enhancement of our environmental performance. I tend to find things easier to visualize if I see them in a, in a linear format. What that says about me, I'm not quite so sure. However, I tend to prefer to see it set out like this. And this is the standard set out now in clauses 4 to 10. They are the auditable clauses of the standard, clauses 1, 2, and 3. You'll see on the top left in a, in a, in a, in a lighter colored box. That just shows you uh, the scope, the normative references, and the terms and definitions. Just one point here. Clause 1 scope is not the scope of your management system. That is the scope of ISO 14001 itself, and to show that it is all about managing uh, the environmental impact of, of a business. We'll come on to your own scope shortly. You'll see that under, under clause four, scope of the management system. So those are the, the seven auditable clauses laid out as plan, do, check, act. And to put a little bit of it, that is the standard itself laid out. I apologize. I say this every time I deliver this slide. Uh, I apologize. It says FDIS. Um, and I always make a note to change it. And I never seem to get around to doing it. So I do apologize. Forget the word or phrase FDIS, which was the final draft international standard. There were no changes. That's why I've not changed the slide. So what you're seeing there is the layout of, of the new standard. The bits in black are common to all standards. So if we were looking at a similar slide for 9001, you would see exactly the same. The only bits that would be different are the bits that I've put in green. Uh, surprise, surprise, uh, it's an environmental management standard. If I was showing this slide for quality, I'd probably show it in blue. And ultimately, when we do this presentation for health and safety, I would show that in red, I suspect. Um, so the bits that we are more interested in uh, are the bits that are in green obviously we are going to cover the whole of the standard but the bits in green are the bits where there are specific environmental areas so let's move on now and have a, a good solid half hour on the clauses of the standard uh, so uh, let's start with uh, 4.1 start at the beginning so if you remember clause 4 was the first auditable standard and this is a new requirement in, in 14,000 in the context of the organization. In fact, it's, it's in all the standards. Um, and this section's really all about us as a business understanding how we are affected not only by the organization, but also how we impact on the environment. And I think that this, this first section, almost the first bullet point on there, is one of the key differences between the old 14,001 standard 
and the new 2015 standard. The old standard was predominantly about how we as businesses impacted on the environment, what we did with our waste, how we used our energy, what we put up our chimneys, what we put down the drain, a little bit about the resources that we use maybe in terms of materials, but generally it was more about what impact we have on the environment. The new standard asks us to, to view the environment as a two-way street. We now sit in the middle of this thing that we call the environment. And we impact on it, and of course it impacts on us. And therefore we have to identify what are the external environmental issues that can impact upon us as a business, and we'll have a look at that shortly. We need to understand what interested parties want of us. So the needs and expectations of those interested parties, who are they? What do they need from us? We need to consider the scope of our system. So in other words, what are the boundaries of the management system, be they geographical boundaries or actually physical boundaries or organisational boundaries, and we'll look at all of those. And, if, and a new requirement, which we'll cover as well, the scope, so the wording of the scope, that's the wording you will see on your NQA certificate, shall be available as documented information. With the old standard, it was a policy that was public information. The wording of the scope now also has to be made uh, public. So the new standard introduces uh, requirements to consider our context, the needs of interested parties, determine those internal and external issues that are relevant, and, and make sure that nothing that happens environmentally can affect our ability to achieve the intended outcome, which is, of course, improved environmental performance. If we get this bit right, and, and this is a very, very important part now, it's almost going back to, uh, to first principles and looking at who are we as a business, what do we do, what are we all about, what's our context. If we get this right, it should ensure that our EMS, our environmental management system, focuses on the issues that prevent, present, should I say, the greatest risk, positive and negative, because you can have positive risk, obviously positive risks and opportunities. So the, uh, the issues that present the greatest risk to our organisations. So what sort of things should we be looking at? I hear you all shouting. Uh, right. Uh, Again, for a little bit of ease, I've tended to group them into three areas. Environmental conditions, external and internal. Again, not going to go through them all, just pick on a couple. So climate change, obviously, uh, been in the news a lot. Uh, likely to bring more extreme weather. We've seen that we seem to be getting more rainfall. The weather is more extreme. Uh, nowadays, when it seems to rain, it rains a lot. We don't seem to get as much of that light drizzle. And when it rains... I live in West Yorkshire, I live in uh, a part of Halifax. A lot of the areas in and around where I live have been very badly damaged by flooding. Boxing Day last year and again in January. That's happening more and more. That is as a result of climate change. Climate change may also affect the type of materials that are available, the raw materials that are available. How are these going to affect us? External issues, what's the legal framework we work in? Um, economic, technological issues that may be appropriate and open to us, social, cultural. Big debate at the moment, external issues, are we going to be in the EU, are we going to be outside the EU? A lot of our current environmental legislation starts off in the EU. How's that going to affect us? Have you thought about that when you will be stood, hopefully, in a, in a, in a, in a booth on the 23rd of June, I think it is, casting your vote? Have you given a thought to how environmental conditions may change and I make no views either way but this is something that again we need to be thinking about and then internally what's the strategic direction of our company what's our capabilities what staff have we got what's our compliance status do we comply with everything we're supposed to do I sincerely hope so if you've got 14,001 what's the culture of the organization do we have any other standards have we got 9,001 have we currently got 18,001 and we'll be working to 45,001 what are our operations and existing systems and indeed our contractual relationships? So there's a whole range of things we need to consider there. The whole idea of this is to provide, and I put high level in bold deliberately, to provide a high level conceptual understanding 
of the important issues that can affect how our environmental responsibilities are managed. I'm going to work through this. This is an example of something that we have considered, can consider, and I would ask you maybe to just read this to give a little bit of understanding of the type of thought process that you need to go through. And this is literally just a multinational food company with operations in a water stressed region and looks at some of the type of contextual issues that organization has to consider. And I would say, I would ask you to maybe just have a look at that at your leisure. 4.2 interested parties. So this is all about understanding the needs and, ex and expectations of, of people who, who have an interest in, in what we do as a business. And of course those interested parties can be a number of people, but we need to determine who they are. We need to look at what it's they want from us. But within this section, as an absolute minimum, all relevant legal requirements have to be included. And as I said earlier, voluntary, organ voluntary arrangements become obligations when you've agreed and adopted them. And indeed, for the needs and expectations, it's entirely up to you which you choose to comply with if it's voluntary. Now, obviously, it depends how you wish to be portrayed as a business, but legislative requirements you have no, no say over. Voluntary ones, it's up to you, but obviously, if you are looking at being a good neighbor, then obviously, you don't want to ignore the people who, who live or maybe work next door to you. So who are they? Employees, board members, shareholders, neighbors, customers, suppliers, contractors, regulators. I could have said almost anybody. And the phrase we tend to use, the phrase I use, is anyone with a legitimate interest in your activities. So that could be a customer, it could be a shareholder, could be Mrs. Smith who lives across the road and wants to hang her washing out on a Monday morning and she needs to know she can do that without getting dirt and soot all over it. It could be as simple as that. So anybody who perceives themselves to either be affected by or have an interest in what your, your organization does. So why, why have we got to do all this? Why is, why is this important? We need to decide the scope because we need to make sure that we're managing all of these different influences. And once you've understood the concept of your organization, where you sit, what it is you're about, what it is you do, who you affect, who you impact upon, we need that helps us define our management system and also helps us define the challenges that we have to deal with. And indeed, the whole credibility of the system will depend upon the choice of the scope. Bearing in mind, I've said now that the scope is going to be made available to interested parties, so it's not going to be very easy to, to actually set out um, a scope as a fairly small part of the organization and try and portray that actually it covers everything. It's something we're going to be paying much more closer attention to in terms of certification and the wording of the scope. But for instance, I have a number of clients whereby the scope of their system covers facilities management. So it covers the way they run their offices, it covers the generation of waste, it covers the use of energy, but it doesn't cover the actual activities of the organization. Now that will still be considered acceptable, but the scope must make it perfectly clear that the environmental management system covers the facilities management of the activities of or the, the operation of the officers belonging to XYZ. It has to be a factual representation of what is included and it mustn't be misleading. It can't create a false impression. Now the old standard, the 2004 standard, asked for organizations to establish a wide range of procedures. These are included an environmental aspects procedure, legal requirements management procedure, awareness, communications, document control, operational procedures, and so on and so forth. Now, instead of asking organizations to write procedures now, the new standard expects the maintenance and control of a wide range of documents. Now, it doesn't say what you have to call them. So if you want to call them procedures and work instructions, you can still do that. You've got that autonomy. However, what you have to do is to ensure that you have sufficient documentation 
to allow the processes within your organization, within your system to be controlled, carried out as planned and achieve desired results. The standard also requires now that the EMS is integrated fully into other business processes. So the days of me turning up on site and saying, uh, presenting myself at reception and saying, okay, I'm here to audit your environmental management system, and the answer I get is, oh, you want Fred, he's just down the corridor, third door on the left, uh, he sits in the office, we don't know what he does, but he seems to keep things ticking over, can't be like that anymore, the EMS has to be integrated into the wider business processes. So therefore, we need to include design, development, procurement. We'll see about that later because there are some new procurement requirements, human resources, sales, marketing. All of these different parts of the business have a part to play within our management system. And indeed, when we are setting up our system or when we're modifying our system, if we've already certified to the old standard, we need to consider the knowledge gained from 4.1 and 4.2, which was the needs of interested parties and the context of the organization. We need to consider that knowledge in developing the right level of documentation within our management system. Now, another new clause, and it's a clause that's caused a little bit of question and is, I would say, a little bit of angst uh, amongst a number of people uh, within some of my larger clients, uh, where chief executives have suddenly woken up to the fact that, yes, we might actually want to go and speak to them and we might want to know what they know and what's their understanding of the system. So this new clause leadership, um, so 5.1 leadership and commitment, and it's there to ensure that an organization's top management uh, provide leadership for its environmental management system for, so you've got to accept total responsibility for it, showing that they support it and providing re uh, adequate resources. It also expects that a policy is formulated, objectives are established, compliance obligations are acknowledged, environmental aspects and impacts are considered, and that EMS roles, responsibilities and authorities are signed. So who is top management. Defined in the standard as the person or group of people who directs and controls an organization at the highest level. So if you have a company-wide EMS, we are talking about your chief executive, your managing director, call it, call that person whatever their job title is. It is the person who's at the top of the tree. If as bullet point Number two says, or the second bullet point, if an AMS has been adopted by a business unit, so for instance, I have a couple of clients whereby um, they've chosen to go forward that each site has its own individual certification, and each site has full autonomy over their own AMS. So there may be half a dozen manufacturing facilities across the UK, and each one has its own individual certification and system. Within there, we, are, we would be talking about the person who is the senior management of that particular site. However, interestingly, the new standard requires top management to take accountability for the effectiveness of, of the management system. So, therefore, we are looking for the person at the top to be able to play an active role in, in the system and have an understanding and uh, provide leadership in, in the management of the system. Just to give you a little bit of guidance, uh, the 2004 standard required three things of, of the leader, establish a policy, appoint a management representative and undertake periodic reviews. Now, interestingly, the term management representative is gone. There is no formal requirement for an AMS representative. That doesn't mean to say any of you who are employed as environmental managers need to start looking for another job. Uh, it can still be carried out. However, it doesn't have to be now a single point of contact. Within the new standard then, there are a number of requirements shown on the right hand side. Uh, again, not going to read them all out, you can read them for yourself, but we are going to cover some of those uh, over the next couple of slides. So the policy itself, the policy is a commitment, a direction or an intention, and it's a formally stated set of words, if you like, from the top management of an organization. As you can see there, 
it has to um, fit in with the nature, scale and environmental impact of whatever it is your company does. It needs to set a framework for the creation and achievement of environmental objectives. It still has to be documented and made available to interested parties. Now, of course, that now goes along with the wording of the scope. Uh, just as a very quick aside, a couple of people have asked me, well, how, how would we show the scope? Two, two ways, in my opinion. One, there is an increasing trend which we're more than happy of and, and, and happy to, to suggest that you actually put a downloadable copy of your certificate on your website. So some organizations now, when you go into the environmental section on the uh, website, will have a copy of the policy statement and will also have a PDF copy of the certificate itself. Happy for you to do that and the wording of the scope is on there. The other way would be to use the wording of the scope as the introductory sentence on the environmental policy. That way then you've got the policy and the scope on one document, killing two birds with one stone. However, the policy has to make a number of commitments. And these are three basic commitments now, uh, slightly different from what was there in the old standard. Protect the environment, fulfill the organization's compliance obligations, legal under the requirements if you wish to choose so, and an interesting one, continually improve the EMS in order to enhance environmental performance. And this is an important point, and I want to stress very, very strongly here. I go in and see management systems against the old standard, the 2004 standard, that haven't changed in over 10 years. So there are procedures that are still dated 2004, 2005. Things haven't moved on. You are making a commitment or your senior managers are making a commitment that they will continually improve the EMS. Now remember, the word continual doesn't have to improve all the time, but it has to have an upward trend. And as with a set of steps, there can be periods of inactivity, but we will be looking for year-on-year -year improvement of your EMS. So those of you, and I hope none of you would say yes to this, but those of you that may have management systems that you blow the dust off once a year when the assessor comes in, that's going to have to change because you will fall foul of this policy commitment. Now, the one again that's caused a little bit of worry is this protection of the environment section. What's it all about? What do we mean? I had one managing director say to me, does that really mean I've got to start sticking bird boxes around all my fences and all my trees around my site? Well, if you want to do that, fine. The way I tend to look at it, it is all about um, being proactive in how we look at managing our impacts on the environment. And it does include the old commitment, which was prevention of pollution, but it does also look at other things, as you can see listed at the bottom. It could be use of sustainable resources, climate change mitigation, so on and so forth. It's not an exhaustive list, and it can include anything relevant to how your organization manages its risk within the context of the organization. However, we will require commitments over and above prevention of pollution because that is not considered sufficient anymore. Prevention of pollution was seen as being reactive whereas protection of the environment is proactive. So we do need to see and your assessors will expect to see some things in there to look at uh, protection of the environment. I'll whistle through this pretty quickly. This hasn't really changed. 5.3 has got a change of number obviously and I've pinched a slight section from, from clause 7, roles, resources, sorry, roles, responsibilities and authorities and indeed now resources as well. So those people involved in the system have to have a clear understanding of their role, responsibilities and also that of others. As we've seen, there is no formal requirement for a management representative anymore. However, we at NQA will still require a named representative for whom we can communicate and deal with in terms of closing out non-conformities, booking dates for audits, et cetera, et cetera. But within the system, there doesn't have to be a named management representative anymore. However, there are a number of requirements uh, of 
the management system itself and of uh, anybody involved in, in, in maintaining it. That's to ensure that uh, the system conforms to the requirements of 14001 and reporting on the performance of the system and environmental performance to top management. And again, top management's role, their part of the bargain is to provide sufficient resources to establish, implement, maintain and continually improve the EMS. And the one I would like to draw most attention to is the final word on that slide, which is time. Uh, quite often you'll find that this does take a little bit longer than you might think. <coughs> Excuse me. So moving on now, uh, clause 6.1, actions to address risks and opportunities. Not to go into too much detail about the word risk itself, however, risk is defined as the effect, the effect of uncertainty. An effect is a positive or negative deviation from what is expected. So according to the standard, risks are potential adverse effects and positives are called opportunities. And the standard requires that an organization is able to achieve the intended outcome of its management system, prevent or reduce undesired effects, and achieve continual improvement in both environmental performance and the system itself. And again, we keep coming back to this term, achieve continual improvement. So expect an organization to determine and address an issue because the risk it poses is considered significant for the organization. This is not too dissimilar to the existing aspects and impacts process. So risks can arise from compliance obligations, and indeed we consider performing beyond simple compliance is actually an opportunity for improvement and an opportunity to enhance your reputation. Risks can also arise from environmental conditions, risks can arise from the needs of interested parties, risks can arise from legislation. So in other words, what we're looking at is very similar to the old standard, to identify the risks, look at the effect or the impact, and then plan to address them, having prioritized them. So as with the 2004 version of the standard, priority is given to the significant issues, both positive and negative. Risks and opportunities need to be identified and there is no formal requirement for a documented risk management process. I've seen the most complicated spreadsheets imaginable with all sorts of risk factors and weighting factors in there. I think the worst one I ever saw had a maximum score of 100,000 uh, and it was a nightmare. Clearly the person who designed it had a, had a liking of Excel spreadsheets. There's no need for that. The standard doesn't say you have to have that. All you've got to do is to come up with a fairly simple way of deciding how to prioritize what is significant. A simple one to five matrix, as you would with a health and safety risk, and, uh, risk assessment, likelihood times effect, something like that. That would be com completely acceptable. So, environmental aspects is a term that uh, has transferred across from the old standard. There is one big change in this area, and this is a fairly well publicized change, but nevertheless is, is an interesting one. And that's the move towards using a life cycle perspective. So what that means is we're not looking for a full cradle to grave, full life cycle assessment, uh, as, as you might think. We're asking for, the standard is asking for, the production of an aspect register, which has to be documented, that acknowledges both upstream as well as downstream aspects. So in other words, we now need to start thinking about where our raw material comes from. That is an aspect. How we get it, is it transported to us? So it's not just what we do and looking downstream from us. We need to look at where we are and then sort of look look the other way and look upstream and say what is the happening upstream that is also an environmental impact of ours. Compliance obligations cover this really. Legal under the requirements uh, is still an acceptable term. You need to determine and have access to the relevant compliance obligations. That's just like the old clause 4.2 in the old standard and determine how they apply to your organization and take them into account within the system. 
and compliance obligations can result in a risk. Now, bearing in mind the standard now works on a risk management basis, that's fine with one key exception. You cannot use risk management when you're talking about compliance obligations. I, you, can't, you can't say there is an acceptable risk of non-compliant. So you can't say, do you know what, it's cheaper if we pay the fine. The chances of getting caught are virtually nil, so we'll, we'll take a chance. And if we get fined, well, we'll consider that as an acceptable part of what we're doing. That doesn't work. Can't happen like that. That would be certainly a major nonconformance. So you can't use the risk management principle on compliance obligations. Planning action, this relates to how to take the actions required to achieve the intended outcomes you require from your management system. So plans need to be formatted into how we're going to integrate uh, any, any improvements we make into not only the EMS itself but other business processes. So for instance, there might be a knock-on effect into our purchasing processes. We need to consider how we're going to test the effectiveness of these actions, how we're going to evaluate them. And we need to consider what options we have available, both technological, financial, and any other business type options. And indeed, what are the wider requirements of our business? So clause 614 deals with how we plan to take action, not the detailed planning itself. So it's almost it's planning to set up the plans. There is a policy commitment, uh, improvement of the EMS and environmental performance. So in order to do that, we have to set objectives and plan to achieve them. The word target has been taken out. That is not there anymore. However, objectives have to be, if we use a well-worn management phrase, smart. So they've got to be consistent with the policy commitments, measurable, monitored, communicated, documented, and updated. And we need to plan who's going to do them, what resources are required, how we're going to evaluate the results, do we need to set performance indicators, and ensure that they are integrated into our business processes. Interestingly, the annex makes a key point here that an environmental objective doesn't have to be set for each significant aspect. So if you've got 30 significant aspects, we don't necessarily need to see 30 objectives at. However, the significant aspects must have a high priority when we're establishing our objectives. And remember that this is a journey, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So therefore, it would be perfectly acceptable to take the top three or four significant aspects and set objectives and targets and gradually work our way down the list. Support and competence clause 7.1, we've referred to earlier, that was the provision of resources. So this is similar to the existing 2004 clause. We need to determine the competency requirements. We're talking about competency now, not training. You'll see in there that it doesn't mention the word training. It's people need to be competent. Competency can include training, mentoring, uh, experience. However, there is a need now to maintain competency records. And the annex states that we have to set competency levels for people who have key roles within the management system. And within the annex, it lists five areas. That's aspect evaluation, contribution to the achievement of objectives, responding to emergency situations, carrying out of internal audits and carrying out evaluation of compliance. Those are listed word for word as I've just made, read them out in the annex of the standard. And our assessors will expect to see defined competencies as a minimum for these five roles. As I said, it's competency. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a degree, you don't have to have a formal external training course. You might have been carrying out internal audits for 20 years under a number of previous standards. That would be considered to be an acceptable competency level. But this is an area that does require records. Awareness point three, similar to, again to the, to the old 2004 clause, minimal change, it applies to contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers. And these are people who we will have identified as part of the context of the organization right at the start. 
these people need to be aware of our policy and the commitments within it, the aspects and potential impacts of their work, what it is that they're doing, how they can impact on the environment, how they can contribute to the effectiveness of our management system, and also the implication or the risks of not conforming, including legislative and other requirements. So it's a little bit more than answers I've tend to be given in the past when I, when I ask about subcontractors or maybe contractors on site, and the answer I get is, well, we've given them a copy of the policy when they signed it. A little bit more than that. Communication, both internal and external, establish a process on what we're going to communicate, when, with whom, and how. So there's these two tiers, internal and external. We need to establish a process. It doesn't have to be documented. It's up to you to decide how you wish to document it. However, the, the annex, interestingly, quotes again five things on, on our communication. Transparent. Appropriate, meets the needs of relevant parties. Truthful and not misleading, perish the thought. How many of us would ever think about doing that? Not exclude relevant information and understandable to relevant parties. So it's going to be in a format that people can understand it. And as part of our assessments going forward, when we audit communication, don't be surprised if we start coming in and looking at things that maybe your marketing team have said on your website. Because if you're making environmental claims, we need to make sure they're truthful and not misleading. So if your website says you're doing something, you're going to have to back it up because we will be asking questions about that. Again, just a few details on what is required both internally and externally. I'm not going to read those out again. That's a table that's there for you to refer to in in your, your own time. Documented information, it's based on the old standard documentation control of documents and control of records. Key differences now that the standard says in a manner sufficient to demonstrate a suitable, adequate and effective EMS. We're not looking for complex all singing, all dancing document control system. Free form can be any form that you like, flowcharts, um, whatever you want. It's entirely up to you. It can be a long, complicated procedure if that's how it works best for you. Whatever you've got has to be controlled, available and protected, but that's it. It's entirely up to you. Gone are the days where, when I ask a question, well, why have you got it documented like that? Well, the standard says I have to. The standard doesn't anymore. It's entirely up to you. If you choose to, if you have a long and complicated document, then that's your choice to do it. And again, just as a, uh, a guide, and I'm not going to go through them all, I've been through the standards, sad that I am, and pulled out every single area where the standard talks about the holding of documented information. The standard doesn't call them documents and records anymore. If you want to, you can, and I have called them that just for ease of terminology because we do, I hope, understand what we mean by documents and what we mean by records. But that, I believe, uh, and I've yet to be corrected, that I believe is a, is a definitive list of things that the standard says you need to have. And there's a number of things that you don't have to have anymore. And these are the things that have, have, that have been taken out. And again, you can see that and read that at your own leisure. I'm conscious it's 25 past one. I've not had any questions yet. As always, I've gone on far too long. We're probably going to go over by about five minutes, so I do apologize if that's the case. If anybody wants to ask any questions, now's probably a good time to start typing. Uh, I will plow on anyway. So, uh, clause eight, operation and operational planning and control. Very, very simple, this. We need to set up the necessary control of our processes to achieve our desired results. So areas requiring control include our significant environmental aspects, our compliance obligations, the objectives that we've set, and other risks and opportunities, including outsourcing and the level of process control and influence we may have. So we need to control planned changes. And it's interesting that we need to have processes in place to, to look at how we plan change within our organization. In the past, 
there are times when we've rung up to book visits and the answer we've got back is, mm, well, we're going through a bit of a change at the moment, can we postpone it for a couple of months? That actually now would be a very good time for us to come because one of the things we have to look at is how you use management systems, be it a quality system or an environmental management system to, to plan those changes. So don't be surprised if the answer that you get, if you say, can we delay is, no, that's a good time to come. So, but we need to design our process to make sure that they're uh, consistent and will prevent people making errors. We need to think about the types of controls that we need to have in there. We need to make sure that the people operating the systems are competent. We need to look at specifications for the processes. What are those specifications going to be? They may be legally set performance specifications, there may be things we set ourselves. We need to look at how we're going to monitor and measure the results and importantly, what level of documentation do we require to ensure effectiveness. And indeed, it is quite acceptable to say that we now rely on the competence of an individual to make sure that that process is carried out effectively. What that will mean, of course, is during an assessment, we would then want to spend a little bit of time chatting to that individual about what they consider competency is and how they use that degree of competency to manage that particular process. And again, bearing in mind now that we are talking about a life cycle perspective being taken into account. So this is an area now where you might actually get customer compliance obligations. So you may find that your customers are imposing environmental considerations, environmental requirements on you, and you have to make sure that your system takes these into account and that there are the processes in place for managing them. And again, you can see on there, it talks about some of the things that was on the previous slide, establishing controls, determining what the requirements are, environmental requirements, monitoring and measuring the results, use of documentation, considering the provision of potential impact information. So in other words, how do we transport it? Can we find a better way of transporting things, delivery, use, end of life treatment? How do people throw away our products? Outsourced processes. We have people doing things for us and outsourced processes now within the scope of the system. We need outsourced processes sometimes in order for our organizations to function. They need to be controlled appropriately to allow the system to achieve its intended functions. The liability for conforming or the conformance of an outsourced process still rests with ourselves. And quite often the relationship with outsourced processes is such that in, in the wider uh, community, although that process might be carried out 50 miles down the road, it's still perceived as being carried out by us ourselves. And we do accept, and the standard accepts, that our level of influence is going to be. Emergency prep, that hasn't changed at all other than the change of numbering, and it's all about uh, looking at the potential situations we identified in 611 earlier, which were the, the, uh, the risks, and preparing to respond with planned prevention or mitigation, responding to actual situations, mitigating the response if something happens, post-emergency evaluation, periodic testing, etc. That really hasn't changed from the existing state. Final two clauses in the last three or four minutes. Still got no questions, so that either says you've all nodded off or hopefully more realistically, you've understood everything I've said so far. Uh, I will say now a last shout out for questions because the way things are going at the moment, we might get to the end and then I'll just draw a line and say that's finished. So about three or four minutes left. Performance evaluation. Organizations must monitor, measure, analyze, and evaluate their environmental performance, which includes evaluating the effectiveness of the EMS itself. So we need to decide what we're going to monitor. How are we going to monitor it? Do we need to use calibrated or other verified equipment? What criteria are we going to use? And this is the first time that 14,001 has actually talked about the use of performance indicators. So we might need to set appropriate performance indicators. So maybe not just absolute measures. So rather than absolute electricity usage, for instance, we might want to set um, 
maybe uh, usage per thousand widgets produced, or if it's heating, it might be done per per square meter of uh, of our site. So we need to look at sort of smart measures that we can use within within the system. But when we're going to carry out that, when monitoring will be performed, and it should say performed, not preformed. Uh, when results are going to be analysed and evaluated, and how we're going to communicate the results both internally and externally, there may be a requirement that we have to communicate externally, particularly if we are operating a, a maybe an environment agency permitted operation. And again, retain documented information. Evaluation of compliance, again, that is very similar to the old standard of uh, evaluating our legal compliance, and it's all about uh, measuring or estimating what we're doing. Um, however, what's quite interesting in here now is there is this additional requirement now that you have to maintain knowledge of your compliance status. So this isn't really now just about a, a once a year activity whereby you, you, you throw an audit resource at something, you go out and do a full audit and then ignore everything for the next 12 months. I should be able to come in as an assessor and say to you, where are you today in your compliance with XYZ legislation? And you should have an answer for me. We need to retain records and we need to make sure that the person carrying out this evaluation of compliance and overseeing this process is competent. Interestingly, something that we're sort of reinforcing as well, a non-compliance is not necessarily elevated to a non-conformance if it's identified and corrected within the scope of the system. What that means is, in layman's terms, don't try and hide a legal non-conformance from us as assessors. If you find that you're carrying out something and it's not meeting legal requirements, identify it document it and raise it within the system yourself. If you're doing that and you've addressed it and you have a plans in process, even though it may still technically be a legal non-compliance, we won't raise that as a non-conformance. We will, we will accept that you've got a handle on the situation, you were aware of it and you're doing something about it. And that is proving to us that the management system works. Internal audit hasn't changed again other than numbering. It's all about setting a program, establishing uh, frequency, methods, responsibilities, etc., and considering within the creation of that program the importance of uh, the area being audited, potential changes that may be happening within the organization, and also really how good the previous audit was. Has it been identified as an area that may cause a problem? And again, each audit must have criteria and scope defined. What is it you're going to look at? Consider process auditing. This is a, a 9001 requirement, but also does move across into 14001. So for instance, you could take a particular activity within the organization. A good example might be an effluent treatment plant. If you, if you were running one, you could maybe, maybe audit that entire process. And you could audit that from a quality and environmental perspective, and indeed health and safety if you wanted. You could do one all-encompassing audit. Uh, but you could do procedural auditing, which is the more traditional way of auditing, and you can also do site and uh, other types of site audits. The standard does allow at a pinch you to audit your own work. Um, this, uh, th this has always been in there that it says audits have to be uh, um, objective and impartial. But for smaller businesses, um, so long as that is the case, we certainly wouldn't have a problem with somebody who's involved in the process also carrying out that, that, process, uh, that, that audit. Management review must include top management in the process and reminder that it's a process, not a meeting. I've seen many people refer to the management review meeting. Now, it can be a meeting if you like, but a meeting is part of the whole management review process. It doesn't have to be done all at once. However, can be part of a regular scheduled, say, board meeting if need be. The inputs and outputs are identified there. They haven't really changed. It's just the terminology itself that has changed in, its, in itself. Final section now called improvement and clauses 10.1 and 10.3 deal with continual improvement. Interestingly, the phrase preventive um, actions has now been removed from 
the standard, which we'll just look on the, look at on the next slide. But it's all about again improving environmental performance. So 10.2 covers non-conformances and corrective actions. Uh, corrective action is now defined as action to eliminate the cause of a non-conformity and to prevent it reoccurring. Preventive action is stopping things happening in the first place and that, that is now covered in clauses 6.1 and 8.1, which is the risk analysis and the um, setting of processes to, to manage our, our risks. So this term is no longer used, however the principle does, does remain the same. Very, very finally, um, Martin Hockaday is our current um, sector manager for the environment and middle of last year he contributed to an article in the uh, AIMA environmental magazine, environmentalist magazine. And, and he made a statement that said that assessing how organisations could be affected by the environment is very different from looking at how its operations affect the environment. And this will require assessors to have a deeper understanding about the organisation, its products, services, supply chains, etc. And that to me sums up the difference, the main difference between the old standard and the new standard. And indeed, I would use that statement for yourselves rather than just assessors. If you were to say we'll require environmental managers to have a deeper understanding, then that is certainly true. But it's also true about your organization itself and including the senior leadership within the organization. It is not now just about what you put down the drain, what you put up your chimneys and what you put in your, your rubbish bins. It's much, much more than that. Nobody's asked me any questions, uh, which is probably good, bearing in mind I've gone over by seven minutes now. Just a reminder that we're sending you the slides in PDF format, and there is a link there on the last slide to our YouTube uh, videos as well. One last very, very final call for questions, and I've not seen anything in there at all at the moment, so I thank you very much for your time. Apologies that I've taken now eight minutes of your time more than, uh, than I thought, but uh, I think it was worthwhile. If this afternoon or in the future you think of another question, uh, do email me, richard.walsh at nqa.com. I will try and respond. I do occasionally get emails from people who watched these presentations previously. But I thank you very much for your time. Thank you for um, listening. And um, 